case, you were reviewing those same documents because you weren't there at the time, correct? Absolutely. Right, so you're reviewing essentially the same documents that other experts have reviewed as they've reviewed this case. And so we've had a number of scientific experts that have reviewed this case based on the documents that have been highly critical of the investigation. Uh, Dr. Dehan, uh, Dr. Byler, Dr. Lentini, Dr. Hurst. Um, would you disagree with all of that criticism? Well, I'm not sure. You have to point out which criticism. I've, I've heard a lot of criticism. You know, I've heard from Dr. Baylor, you know, he wrote we were doing voodoo. You know, yes, I would absolutely. He said there was absolutely no standard that we complied with, either current standard or their standard. Yes, I would vehemently disagree with that. Would I disagree with Mr. Lantini's characterization that 80% of the fire investigators in the country are a bunch of yahoos? Yes, I would disagree with that. Yes, what specifically am I disagreeing with or agreeing with? I'm just wondering if any of the criticism that's been provided, you would, the, the, the office would agree with, or do you, you absolutely stand by the original? No, we, I think we've started out by saying, you know, the, the reports that were written, the report that was written by our, our employee, Mr. Vasquez, left much to be desired, I think. I, we, we would agree to that. It included maybe superfluous information that, given the, the, given the knowledge that we have now, should have not been included. It probably didn't include uh, enough dialogue on certain, on, on certain uh, 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 information that should have been expanded on, would have been helpful, would have been helpful. But to assume that, you know, just automatically, again, like, you know, I've heard, you know, uh, Mr. Perwani, I think you made a statement, you know, making a speech somewhere, I read it in the newspaper, where we used bad science and everything was wrong. What would you, let's be a little specific. What, what, what bad science? was used. The science that, that, that ultimately that conclusion right now, again, I think I pointed out, you could try the case today and have experts on both sides, you know, and, 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 and go on for days, particularly if you had good attorneys. I guess one of the, I, the issues that the commission might have is that, that we don't have an expert that has actually looked at that and, and would, would render the opinion that they would support the original conclusions that were made back in 1991, because all of the experts that have looked at it have made, um, have been quite critical of the investigation. So I, I realize that in any case you're going to have different opinions, but I don't think we have that opposing opinion from someone who is a qualified fire investigator or fire science expert that's saying, yes, I would look at this case and I would absolutely agree with it, other than perhaps the state fire marshal, or am I wrong? No, I'm not sure. I haven't talked to, you know, I haven't talked to other fire experts. We haven't gone out and solicited. We haven't gone out and attempted to find somebody or hire somebody. I know I've talked with a lot of fire investigators. I know I've talked with members of the IAA, you know, uh, 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 authority, you know, presidents and things of that, that nature, people that are up and, you know, and they're all concerned about the nature because they believe that we are correct. You know, we, we believe that there's motives and people are, you know, going a little extraneous, a little far. I mean, you know, the whole point of saying, you know, like, just saying, well, explaining away the fact that an accelerant is found at the threshold and just saying, well, they used to cook out in the front yard and saying, well, that's an explanation. Therefore, that hypothetical, you know, therefore, that's gone out the window. So all you have is purportedly floor burns. Uh, you know, that's a bit of a stretch. Where's the where's the uh, the intellectual honesty there? To 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 purport, you know, to say, you know, I've read so much as to, you know, you're looking at a, a program and somebody's saying, well, the fire was caused by flashover. I've heard some people say, well, it was just a fire. Well, it's not just a fire. There's no such thing as just a fire. You know, and flashover. The 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 point is, is that flashover, a full explanation of flashover. It doesn't say that you can't determine that those were still evidence of an accelerant. It, there's no, there's no treatise, there's no book that says that. Any other questions? Well, I, I have a question. Uh, you know, with the accelerant at the door, I think that there was a misunderstanding that the witnesses had been, you know, interviewed. And they were thinking that they didn't know that the door was intact during part of where the witnesses had come up. It wasn't completely burned away. 
when they got there, and I think they were kind of uh, thinking that your office didn't know that, uh, Vasquez didn't know that. Um, but they did know that because they talked to the witnesses and said they knew the door was intact and that this accelerant was found under the door, basically. Right. Right? right. And then later, as the fire progressed, it burned the door down. Right. But, it does, yeah, it doesn't necessarily mean there was, you know, there, in, in, in fact, the liquid that was found, you know, it wasn't gasoline. It wasn't like, you know, somebody poured gasoline, the allegation somebody poured gasoline, you light a fire. Blow up. That wasn't the case. That wasn't the case. The allegation was that there, there, you know, the, the, in, in the context of let's say Mr. Vasquez saying there were multiple points, maybe that was not a correct assessment of what transpired or what the evidence shows. But the evidence did show the, the connecting and the possibility. Now, once the fire reached a certain stage, once the front windows were broken out by the defendant, there was a huge exacerbation of fire. And then ultimate testimony says that ultimately there was somewhat of an explosion that took place, which probably was the, 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 the flashover. There's been some discussion by some people that I've talked to that indicate, well, maybe flashover really didn't because, and they look at different factors. But I think it, it, it begs the point because ultimately there was full room involvement, which, which is the real point. I think uh, uh, Mr. DeHaan alluded to, well, you know, uh, when you have the flashover, you know, there's a possibility of that low burn. But it also, it also is, can be evidence of that there was some liquid down there. It, 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 there there's, there's just so many areas in the fire investigation area that it, it's difficult to just say uh, you're dealing with absolutes. Uh, I have one quote here that I just love. Uh, <coughs> Where it talks in terms of so while it's true that an accelerants make fire burn more rapidly, a rapidly burning fire does not necessarily indicate an accelerant. The 921 is wrapped just full of that kind of language that leaves it up to interpretation, cumulative thinking, putting together, and Coming up with an opinion. So, so basically, what what the fire marshal's office is contending and and and, and the finding that in fact the natural causes and accidental causes were in fact excluded. Yes. So that in fact. Yes. By exclusion, therefore, this is arson. Well, as we noted up there, by exclusion, you know, it said in nine twenty one again, it says. If you eliminate all natural causes, now is that possible? I think Dr. DeHaan indicated uh, he, he didn't agree you could eliminate them all. I'm not, I'm not sure that you can. I think you, you indicated that possibly. But 921 will tell you if you can eliminate all the possible ignition sources, you know, you got a tough job in front of you trying to make it unless you've got what? A positive indicator. And we had the positive indicator. There was the positive indicator. So even 921 tells you today that that's a reasonable call. I guess that's where there's a difference of opinion. And because Dr. Vilo has to go, and I know that uh, John's going to allow you to have the last word today, and I know we've got many more questions for you, but Dr. Vilo, is there anything you can you know that, that, that you would like to add? I know we're going to have more questions for, for Mr. Salazar, but... You the, the things that I wrote down while I was listening, uh, there, there were questions as to uh, uh, Investigator Vasquez. Uh, he acknowledged himself that he didn't investigate the debris that had been shoveled out of the room. He acknowledged that himself. That's not my conclusion. He said that. His findings included accelerant being poured on the porch. It's inconsistent with the eyewitness testimony. It's inconsistent. So you accept eyewitness testimony to help you decide whether or not arson occurred? When we ta take do you, this... Do you or don't you? We evaluate eyewitness testimony. He simply ignored it was this eyewitness testimony was indeed taken. I mean, there was extensive interviews 
Whether Mr. Vasquez knew about it or not is certainly open to question because with that piece of evidence that contradicts his, his uh, conclusion, he need not accept it at face value, but he needs to evaluate it and have a rationale for why and how that observation is not what it appears to be or is otherwise potentially, you know, I mean, for whatever reason, invalid. For what is per se of argument, that eyewitness testimony was we didn't see someone pouring something all over the porch, right? No, that is not the testimony. What is it then? The testimony was that they saw uh, Willingham on the porch with no fire on the porch and light smoke coming from the door. Okay. And, and so that, 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 is, that is contradictory, of course, to the notion that the way Mr. Willingham started this fire was to pour liquids in the kitchen's room, then pour liquids into the hallway, and then pour liquids onto the porch and ignite them. It is straightforwardly contradictory of that. And it is how, perfectly how reasonable. How does that conclude that they were able to see everything that Willingham did? The point is that they made observations that are contradictory to his conclusion. It is They're his not contradictory. They simply don't support it at that point. But if he pours it at a different point that they didn't see, then it did happen. The fire was already started at that point, wasn't it? I don't know. Your witnesses, you know, tell one story. You know, what I what I'm really amazed at is the selectiveness, and I think this is what the fire marshal's office is concerned about. You're very selective about what you pick and choose. That witness is credible because it fits with how you want to do it. I, I did, I did not assert that he was that that witness was credible. I asserted that because that piece of evidence existed, that the credibility of that observation needed to be evaluated. Either either Vasquez had to show that that piece of data was wrong, or acknowledge that it contradicted its finding. And hence, he had to abandon his finding. It doesn't mean that the, that the eyewitness is correct. It puts a burden on the investigator that he did not accept. Well, I'll, I'll let, uh, I do have a question, though. If you, are, if, if you did start an arson with an accelerant, and you put some in one bedroom, and you walk down the hall and dripped it down the hall, and you're going out the door and you drip it at the door, but it's not on fire yet when people show up, how does that rule it out? I mean, I've seen people drip you know, kerosene from a fire that they're starting, and, and I don't see you know, it immediately pick up on the accelerant as a glass. As a fire gets bigger, sometimes I see little burn marks in the grass next to where the fire started. So what I'm asking is, if the fire is coming down the hall, couldn't it ignite it later? I mean, would it be but on fire that second? That's not Vasquez's theory of the fire. That's not his theory. You can make up other theories. There are other theories that could be now argued at this point in time if, with the same data. But he did what he did. And we're evaluating what he did. We're not evaluating what you might be able to do today. We're evaluating what he did. It's not hypothetical what could be done. It's what was done. Thanks. Thank you for sticking around. Mr. Salazar, you have any other uh, things that you didn't get to that we interrupted you. Oh, I, I, We're going to come back to you if you, if you want a little bit. Okay. okay. Go ahead. Um, I think we talked about some of the other experts that have looked at the case, and, and I think we understand that, that your position is that you respectfully disagree with those opinions. But has anyone from your office ever been uh, critical of that original investigation back in 1991? Not that I know. So nobody from the state fire marshal's office ever went on the record and offered any kind of commentary on uh, or criticism? No. Well, well let, me, let me back up. I think your, 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 your question can be interpreted one way and another way, and I want to just see if I can cover the full spectrum. Number one, we were never notified of a problem with this particular investigation until I would say probably 2007, 2006, when we started getting several open records requests that came to my attention 
Uh, and, I, and, and the reason is because I'd reviewed the case and I started wondering why is there so much excitement about this. Uh, we were never aware, nobody ever served us with papers uh, regarding the execution, attempts to slow down the execution. Nobody served us with papers on that. <clears throat> I think what Dr. Kerrigan is referencing is a quote uh, that she saw in a newspaper by, uh, I think, Mr. Cheever, uh, that on its face does appear to contradict the position of the fire marshal's office. Are you familiar with that? Yes. I mean, I've talked to Mr. Cheever, and I'd be more than happy to let him address it directly. Is that what we're talking about here? I think that would be good. That would be useful. We're all aware that sometimes what gets reported in a news story or in the media is not the full story. And I think you know what I'm talking about. I'm talking about an article that was published in the Chicago Tribune in 2004, uh, where, um, shall I read it? It says, even Edward Cheever, one of the state deputy fire marshals who had assisted in the original investigation of the 1991 fire, acknowledged that her criticism was valid. At the time of the Corsicana fire, we were still testifying to things that aren't accurate today, he said. They were true then, but they aren't now. Hurst added, Hurst, he added, was pretty much right on. We know now not to make those same assumptions. Would you like to add to that? Was there information that you gave that was not printed that would perhaps provide the commission with a better understanding of your criticism of that? I case? think perhaps maybe I could give a little clarification of comments that were attributed to me. Uh, I was approached on the telephone initially by this particular reporter from the Chicago Tribune. My response to him, he was requesting an interview of some sort. My response was that I would not be able to officially give him an interview without approval from headquarters. Okay. On Veterans Day, I don't remember, it was several weeks later, he came to my, my house. I was on a state holiday and drove into my yard, gets out of the vehicle, and proceeded to ask for an interview. And I told him I had not received any kind of clarification from Austin as to whether or not that was permissible. Had he, when he admitted he had not, he had a couple other carloads of individuals with him, photographer and so forth. And he told them to go on back to the car because I told him I was not going to officially talk with him about either of the cases. And he asked me in general terms, not specifically related to either case about investigations in general the general field and changes that were taking place and i did state to him that in regard to the willis case i would not testify the same because my understanding of things had changed that some things that i had testified to and that in a general sense were being testified to by the general community of investigators were no longer considered to be absolutely true in that regard. And in that case, I would not testify the same again. And there's nothing remarkable about that. I mean, for those of us that are, we're, most of us are scientists. As the science changes, our opinions change. So that's absolutely justifiable. Would you agree? I felt like it was at the time, yeah. Still think it is. Did you feel like the reporter took your words out of context by connecting them more specifically to the William case? Yes, I did. Ever had that happen to you before? Yes, I have. Lesson learned? Yes, sir. When you called in to, or let me just ask you, I might be jumping the gun. Were you ever able to call in to your superiors and, and ask for any kind of clearance to, to talk with the reporter? I never tried to. I got you. Thank you very much. Oh, well, I do have another follow-up question. Um, you were talking specifically about the Willis case and your testimony in that, and that it might be a little different now than it would have been back at the time you testified. Are there some examples that come immediately to mind? Well, the primary thing that, that has changed with me since that particular investigation, uh, and, and maybe, I don't know, maybe there's some clarification needed uh, 
in a general sense as well, if you'll allow me a little uh, latitude. Let me just address my involvement in both of these cases because there may be a misconception as to what my involvement really was. In the Willis case, I had come on board with the agency in November, middle of November of 1985. And we were here in Austin in training until early April of 1986 and at that point I was assigned to the Lubbock field office. I was assigned to the Lubbock field office as a trainee investigator for lack of a better term assigned to accompany the investigator in the office on cases until the director of that office felt like that I was well enough versed in procedure and so forth of the agency that I could proceed on my own. I was still assigned to assist investigator Leroy Brown in the Willis case. When it comes to the Willingham case, I was at that time an investigator on my own and at that time Manuel had come back to the office from Corsicana and requested the regional director send another investigator down to go over it with him just to see if there was anything that he was missing. It was not a formal formal uh, review of the case. I, I made no notations. I made no report. I didn't render a finding in the case. My position was to see if there was anything that stood out to me as possibly being erroneous. And I did not see anything uh, while I was down there. That was the total involvement I had in Willingham. In the Willis case, uh, Leroy Brown had left the employee of the agency at the time of the trial. And I was asked by the prosecutor to be one of three expert witnesses to provide testimony, but not to provide testimony specifically about the investigation because I did not make notations, made no report, and didn't render a finding in that case either. Uh, his position for me was to testify in general terms of fire behavior. Now, specifically what may have changed since that time till now that might make it so that I would not support the finding that, that I supported at that time. My understanding of, of flashover, not per se the term flashover, but a more practical sense of understanding the implications. And I think sometimes it's easy to get a theoretical knowledge of what a phenomenon might be, and it's still a little bit different to get the practical sense for the, the power and, and what it actually can accomplish. During that time period and prior to that time period, I had been through numerous training seminars and so forth. And one of the things, that, one of the methods of heat transfer that is quite primary in fire investigation is the, the uh, transfer by radiant heat the heat layer in the ceiling radiating down and, and ultimately assisting in bringing the entire room to a state of flashover. In the theoretical learning, the, the materials that we were being taught, we were being taught, and correctly so, that radiant heat travels in direct line pattern. Doesn't go around corners, doesn't make curves and so forth. And the theory at that time that I was under the understanding of was that radiant heat would come down and strike the surface of this desk but it would be absorbed by this desk and would not travel through to the floor. It would travel to the floor here and would impact the surface of the floor here. Therefore you would have patterns that could be developed in areas of exposed flooring due to the radiant heat and following up with flashover conditions. But we were being taught that burn patterns under furnishings was suspicious. 
because the radiant heat, the theory of the radiant heat, you know, being absorbed and not continuing on through. Part of what was being utilized by Investigator Brown to make his determination in the Willis case was the burn patterns beneath the furnishings. Today I could not testify in the same manner of general fire behavior that I would have testified at that time of that trial because of the, the better understanding that I have of temperature and inversions and heat being transferred in ways other than just radiant heat during the process of flashover. And Dr. DeHaan can give you a much better explanation than I'm sure I have. But. Very informal, yes. Uh, but you presumably had the opportunity to look at some of those records or not? In the Willingham case? Yes, I did. I, I looked at some of the records. And, and would it be your opinion today that you would agree with the original finding? I, I don't have anything that I have seen that would cause me to dispute it. I feel like that based on what I saw in my review of the documents that I did review, the photographs that I reviewed, I haven't seen anything that would cause me to say that Manuel was in error in making the determination that he did. So you wouldn't have the opinion that it was undetermined? I think that had Manuel chosen to call it undetermined, he certainly could have done that uh, and, and really not been criticized for it. But I don't criticize him for calling it an incendiary fire either. I think he was justified in, in the things that he saw based on his understanding and his training at the time. Even though he recognized that the patterns could have been produced by something other than an accelerant. I think it would depend okay. some, well, I'm not sure what his testimony was in that regard, and, and if, if you permit me just a little digression. Having testified in court and been subjected to both direct and cross-examination, and I'll try not to offend members of the bar, uh, <laughs> Sometimes the questioning can be very direct and very intense and you can be required to give an answer that you really would rather not give in that manner under that condition. You might prefer to give more explanation, but for whatever reason the judge doesn't give you that latitude and the attorney is pressing you and doesn't give you the latitude. So I can envision a situation, and not knowing what, what the response was and how he came about to say that, I could envision where he would be asked, is it possible? And what are you going to say? I want, I want to ask a couple of background questions. You said that you've been put up to the Lubbock Field Office, and then Mr. Brown, I think you said, left the fire marshal's office. Just help me kind of understand how things were back then. Um, would there be more than one agent assigned to that field office, or usually just one agent? Or when I went, I'm sorry. when I went out to Lubbock, when I was first assigned, I was filling a vacancy. I see. There were two vacant. Uh, there were two positions for investigators in the Lubbock field office. Leroy Brown was one, and I was filling a vacancy where one of the prior investigators had left and gone to the private sector. Were there some field offices in Texas that might be smaller and had only one investigator, or was everybody doubled up, or just different deals, different places? I, I couldn't be for sure on this, but I don't think there were any regional offices at that time that had less than two. And I'm not sure that there was any at that particular time that had more than two. I'm, I'm asking you to try and remember stuff from years and years ago. Yes, sir. Um, the reference materials that y'all needed to refer to, did you have everything there? Did you ever have to, to check in with a different office or go to different sources to, to get reference materials that you needed to consult with if you did in an investigation? At the time that I was assigned to Lubbock, 
the field office had no library of reference material. Anything that was there was stuff that was personally owned by individuals. Uh, approximately three years after I went to work for the state, I was able to secure a transfer to the Dallas office. And it was actually in Duncanville. And in that office, we did have a reference library. The majority of the books in the reference library were telephone books. We did have a very small amount of training materials that uh, the office had amassed from not really a very good term. It wasn't a very large collection. From different courses you'd go to? Courses that you would attend and so forth. And then we had, each one of us had materials that we had collected from our own personal training sessions that we'd been to and so forth. Did you ever attend any training courses with uh, Mr. Vasquez in uh, Texas Engineering Extension Service? I don't know specifically about TEAT's courses. Uh, I, I'm sure that I did because I was assigned in, in Dallas at the same time I got transferred Manuel also got transferred back to the Dallas office he had been in Corpus uh, I'm sure that we attended training seminars and so forth I, I couldn't tell you exactly you know what they were and, and whether they were TEKS classes or not I don't know we attended a lot of classes that would be put on by the North Texas Fire Investigator Association or the Tarrant County Fire Investigator Association. Uh, some training sessions that were put on by state chapters of the IAAI, the International Association of Arts Investigators. Uh, uh, training seminars by prosecutors and so forth. So, you know, I, yeah, I attended training sessions with him, but I don't. So you're still a current fire investigator, is that correct? Yes, ma'am. And so uh, during the, uh, these years, as new editions of NFPA 921 have been revised and updated and made available, you've been made aware of those through the various trainings that you've attended? I'm, I'm glad to say that our agency now provides copies of the uh, NFPA 921 to each investigator as new additions come out. That wasn't always the case. And when did that dissemination strategy of providing the latest edition of NFPA 921 begin? I think the first copy that, that we were given in the field by the agency was a regional office copy along in about 1998, uh, if my memory is correct. I can't tell you exactly what year it was that we began to receive individual copies. Okay, trying to keep in with our time frame. If there aren't any further questions, I was going to bring up Mr. Wood. Thank, Thank you. Buddy Wood. I work for the Houston Fire Department's Fire and Arson Investigation Division. I've been with the department uh, approximately 35 years, 32 of which have been in the Arson Division. And I was, uh, thank you for inviting me here today. I was to come here and talk a little bit about training and uh, how the changes in fire and science have occurred and how field practitioners have absorbed those changes through training. And uh, I can talk a little bit, uh, a lot of what I was going to talk about, uh, Ed's already covered. But um, new fire investigators uh, in Texas usually begin their training when they begin uh, attending their basic arson investigator certification school. And that is sponsored by the Texas Commission on Fire Protection. Now, to my knowledge, prior to 1992, the agency or the campus, whoever was conducting the school, would develop the curriculum, including lesson plans. And they would submit them to the State Fire Commission for approval. And once it was approved, then that school or that agency would put on the, the school. Once the students complete that school, they're eligible to take the state exam. And that state exam is administered by the Texas 
Commission on Fire Protection. Uh, once they pass that exam, then they are certified by the state of Texas as an arson investigator. Now, arson investigators who investigate fires involving crimes have to also be certified Texas peace officers. So there's two certifications that uh, <coughs> these arson investigators have to hold before they can conduct fire investigations and render opinions and testify in court. And that's through the Texas Commission on Fire Protection and through T-Close. The Co Texas Commission on Fire Protection requires 20 hours of continued education annually. And these uh, courses are supposed to be fire-related courses, some type of fire-related courses. T-Close requires, or uh, the peace officer end of it, requires uh, the same thing, 40 hours every two years. So to my knowledge, that's the only continuing education that's required by the two certifications that investigators hold. Uh, after students become both certified peace officers and arson investigators, then normally, whatever agency they're working for, they'll be assigned to a more experienced investigator and work under that investigator for a, a length of time before they are normally allowed to make a, a determination as to origin cause of fires. And that length of time is usually decided on by their supervisor or agency. One of the problems that I've seen uh, is that if a new investigator is assigned to a more experienced investigator, and that individual has not had the recent updates or attended the schools or seminars to where these recent updates and, and whatnot have been discussed and covered, then that new investigator is not getting the material either. And it can be a problem where a, a cycle develops. Uh, but I have seen a, a great improvement in the training in our field of, of fire investigation over the years. Uh, Mr. Wood, did, did you have uh, any uh, contact with the materials of the Birmingham case? I did. Uh, have you had an opportunity to go through those materials and uh, along with some other people uh, evaluate them? Yes, sir. Uh, who are the other people that you shared that process with? Uh, one was uh, Dave Ryder, who is an electrical engineer. Uh, another is uh, a fire investigator, Tommy Singh. Uh, another investigator by the name of Corey Martin. These are individuals that I know that are in the fire investigative field who I trust. And uh, we, uh, we, we met one time together. And other than that, we individually looked over the material and had discussions over the phone and through emails. Uh, the possibility did exist at one point in time that uh, we may conduct a review, but that never materialized. Uh, Did you uh, feel like you became familiar enough with the case to form any opinions about it? I've never formed an opinion on a, a fire as to origin and cause without physically being there and, and, and looking at the scene. I have uh, done peer reviews where I've discussed certain aspects of an investigation, like we did in this case, but I've never actually formed an opinion without physically being there. Uh, given the, the number of years of experience as a fire investigator that you have had, I assume that, that you would have been around and at least somewhat familiar with uh, the standard of practice as it existed back in 1991 for investigation? Yes, sir. Uh, and uh, we've heard endlessly that there wasn't a standard of practice, at least uh, a uniform written one, uh, but that some areas did have uh, some sort of uh, process or systematic approach that they would have. Um, what is your opinion on that as far as 1991? My opinion is that uh, for a long time prior to, <coughs> excuse me, prior to 1992 when 921 first came out, my opinion is that fire investigators have been using this scientific method for many, many years. It wasn't called that, it wasn't labeled that, but uh, as I read uh, Fire Marshal Vasquez's report and the other reports, if you were to uh, line them up side by side with what 921 suggests now, 
the step-by-step -step procedure is identical as to what occurred at that investigation. Well, there would certainly be differences in terms of some individual um, things that do or do not suggest arson. You would agree with that? Oh, yes, definitely, yes. But in terms of the process or the sy systematic approach or the scientific method, whichever one, uh, you're saying that there was such a method in this case? Yes. Okay. And was it uh, a method, as far as you could see, that was consistent with the standard of practice to the extent that it existed uh, in 1991? To what I was exposed to, yes, sir. Yes. Okay. And, and did you see anything that uh, would cause you to believe that it was so far outside of the norm for that period of time uh, that it was negligent? Not negligent, no. Okay. Uh, I assume you agree uh, that science did move on, that there are a number of uh, specific things that were evaluated in there that we probably wouldn't do today. No, that question. Uh, did you uh, think that that alone uh, makes what he did uh, useless? No, sir, not at all. What did you conclude? Uh, I think there were indicators there, fire indicators that are still looked at as uh, as proof of a possible uh, incendiary fire. Specifically, what are those? The uh, one thing that I haven't heard discussed today is the uh, construction of the flooring of that bedroom. And to my knowledge, from what I could ascertain without being there, just reading reports and whatnot, there was five layers of materials on that floor. And uh, I think that's an important factor that needs to be considered in 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 interpreting the, the fire damage, the fire patterns, the irregular shape patterns there. And I'm not 100% sure that uh, flashover even occurred in that room. Why does the thickness and the number of layers there matter to suggest that there was arson? <coughs> well, the, the materials that I have been made or told that was present there are materials that uh, the damage was significant. It went through all the way to the, the fifth layer to the oak floor, wood flooring. And I'm not sure without flashover occurring if that damage would be there without the presence of an ignitable liquid. So uh, I'm going to break this down into my kind of language. Uh, are you suggesting that there was something poured on the floor and burned because of the depth of the burning? Partially, yes. Possible. Possible. Um, Another thing I haven't heard talked about is that when fire investigators uh, secure debris samples for pre-analysis, they expect a negative return because they're volatile liquids. They evaporate. They burn away. To my understanding, the, the one sample that came back positive was under the threshold, the aluminum threshold, that was somewhat protected by that aluminum threshold. Which would retain the liquid to some degree. Burning off? Yes, sir, to some degree. Okay. So is it significant to you that uh, it came back negative for the middle of the room? Does that automatically tell you that it could be an arson? No, sir, not at all. And I guess what I'm hearing is you tend to find negatives even in known arsons. That's correct. Where you have other independent uh, verification that a particular fire was an arson. Yes, sir. So, so the depth of burning through the through the floor for the fifth layer suggests to you possible accident, uh, accelerant being used. The possibility, yes, sir. Especially a flashover did not occur. And and you feel that there was no flashover. No I'm, I'm not sure. Uh, I was talking with Dr. Bowder before he left, and uh, I've been peer peer reviewing this with uh, other investigators, and I'm not sure if you. Uh, can have full room involvement without flashover, but I'm believing that you can. So the floor construction and the chemical testing that was positive at the threshold, are those for you the two most compelling indicators that are left in the original investigation documents? Well, before I answer that, one of the, one of the things that uh, is so prominent about to me about fire investigations is uh, a lot of the evidence is circumstantial. We hardly ever have direct evidence. So the totality of the evidence is so very important, including witness accounts. Now, when witness accounts are given, sure, they should 
but an attempt should be made to corroborate those accounts and see if they are accurate and truthful. But uh, the totality of the evidence is, is what the majority of a lot of our, our calls are made on, as opposed to one or two indicators. And does that go back to the slide that um, Mr. Salazar showed us that ultimately a fire investigator has to take all the data and come to a conclusion? Yes, sir, it is. The other thing that I'd like to uh, have y'all consider is <coughs> written transcriptions of testimony can be misleading. Anybody that's testified a few times or more knows that. And it seems like the testimony was relied upon pretty heavily as to what occurred out there. But from past experience, I can tell you that transcribed testimony from witnesses on the stand don't always portray what actually happens out at the scene. Now, it sure would have been nice for the reports to have been more complete. We're never going to know what was in his mind. Do you conduct reviews of investigations of... Uh fire investigators in your office? Yes, sir. And when you do that, I assume you read the reports? Yes, sir. Do you also talk to them? Yes, sir. Is it important to talk to them? <coughs> yeah, you give them a chance to uh, answer questions, yes. Is there some disadvantage uh, to not talking to them? I would certainly think so, yes, sir. Would you think that that would be a fair way to evaluate someone's work, assuming that they are available? Yes. Does that trouble you about this particular scenario, about, about how the investigation is being handled and looked at and done? Are there ways in which this has been conducted that you could offer constructive advice on how, from the point of view of someone who could be investigated in the future, you would want to see it done? Yes, sir. I'd love to hear them. Well, um, it's so hard to determine what the term standard of care was back then and by what agency and by what in individual investigator. We're never going to know exactly what that standard of care, if you will, was. But uh, like I said, the reports, if the reports were more complete, then we would have not had a better idea. Um, but there are indicators there. There are indicators that can't be explained away. Uh, a lot of times the investigators that are conducting those investigations are, are speaking for the victims. Sometimes a vic in this case, they can't tell you anything. So all the investigator has is the scene. And the old adage that fire tells a story, I don't know how many times I've taught that in my classes, but it's true, it's accurate. Is it sort of a metaphor? Yes, sir. Do we mean but that it's literally? Well, it does tell a story to me. If, you, if it's interpreted correctly, it tells you a story of the history of that fire. I don't know how else to say it. When you say that there are no other indicators that can't be explained away, do you mean that there are no other alternative explanations for uh, the things that were documented in the investigator's report? I mean, there are indicators that could be... Uh, that could go both ways. Could have been caused by an incendiary fire and could have been caused by other than incendiary. I wanted to clarify that because when you say they can't be explained away, you don't mean that the conclusion should be also. No, ma'am. Okay. It means that it's possible that it's also. That's correct. Okay. I think you also... But, uh, but, but, oh, but let me, let me uh, complete what he's saying. But you are not sure there was a flash over. I am this not. is why you're concluding that, that those indicators then imply arson. I'm sorry, could you repeat? Uh, since there was no flashover, then obviously those indicators are more consistent with an arson. I believe so, yes, sir. I see. I'm sorry, Sarah. That's okay. Um, I had one more question. You were talking about how the training has improved dramatically over the years, and I think everyone's pleased about that and not surprised. It happens in every discipline, not just in fire science, fire investigation. Um, are there cases um, now as a very seasoned and experienced fire investigator with all of the scientific knowledge that we have today, are there cases where you provide opinions today that are very different from maybe opinions you may have provided back in the early 1990s? 
Me personally? Yes, you personally. <clears throat> I can't think of uh, one right now where I would have changed my call uh, based on the, the changes in fire science. I've been lucky to be exposed to some good training and, and uh, although <clears throat> I will point out this and this is one area that y'all may be helpful in is usually when budgets are cut in an apartment the training division is the first one to get to ax and uh, even with the federal agencies uh, I was on a task force with ATF and one of the reasons I went there was to try to obtain training and they get their training division got to ax so uh, and the the uh, mandatory continued education I talked to you about I would like to see it specified as to what type of training that mandatory training should consist of and Currently, not leave it up off, the investigator chooses at this point what he just has to have a certain number of hours well um, the fire commission has to approve it but I'm not sure and, and there's some great people over there who have done some great work so I don't want to talk bad about them but I think it needs to be specified especially there are classes out there currently that are talk about the changes in fire science that have taken place, but not enough, not near enough. And so when you suggest that there ought to be specific classes, maybe those classes ought to specifically involve advances in science. Yes, sir. Rather yeah. than general techniques or, or other areas. Yes, and, and agencies aren't going to pay for it. My agency won't pay for it. In the one case that you've identified over all of those years, where you say you would provide a different opinion. As a fire investigator, what's your obligation in terms of rectifying that opinion? What do you do? I've never been made of an obligation. I've never been made aware of any such obligation other than a moral obligation. There's nothing that I know of uh, in any SOP or you know, uh, written directive or anything like that. Is that interesting? Yeah. That's what we've been hearing. Other questions? Thank you very much. Sir. Mr. DeHaan, if, uh, if you have some other comment, we can give you about five minutes. Sure, because I'm, I'm running out of time. I hear you are. <laughs> You've been very patient. <clears throat> I addressed uh, the issue of uh, the significance of ignitable liquids at the door threshold um, during my presentation this morning. Uh, but uh, some, some comments have been made here this afternoon about floor damage and um, irregular burns and things like that and why, that, why that's significant. Um, this is uh, Kirk's sixth edition. That's the current edition of my book. And uh, there's a, a photograph, figure 9.20, and I think almost the same picture, if not the same picture, is in the two most recent issues of 921. And it's pictures taken of, or a picture taken of a fire test that I helped conduct. And it shows extensive, irregular, deep burning of the composite floor in this, uh, this turns out to be a mobile home. And the issue is, how do I get deep burning? Well, I got to keep something burning long enough on a floor to make that happen. And in all the tests I've done with ignitable liquids of all kinds, pouring it on floors of all kinds, what happens is ignitable bur liquids burn away uh, to the point, not necessarily to the point where they're undetectable chemically, but they are no longer contributing to the fire. And um, that makes it very difficult, if not impossible, for the, the fire to progress downward into the floor. Whereas if I have extensive hot smoke layer, has been described here by several, uh, several witnesses, that I can keep a lot of radiant heat on the floor for prolonged periods of time and create irregular deep burns, especially as the floor coverings themselves start to decompose and burn and char and melt and do whatever else, as well as any intermediate target materials like clothing and toys and things like that. So that all contributes to the, the possibility. There's also a couple of pictures in here. See if I can find it real fast. Of, a, of the aftermath of a fire test. This is figure 7.4 A and B. And this was a fire test conducted by, <coughs> excuse me, a colleague of mine 
uh, Jamie Novak in Minnesota, and it shows extensive deep irregular burning of, uh, of not only the floor but an entire room um, with um, without any ignitable liquids. And so, does, I would, does 921 give a fire investigator uh, room to interpret that either way? Yes, in fact, when uh, 921, currently at least, I don't know how far back it goes, but when it discusses irregular burns on floors, it specifically cautions investigators not to interpret pool or pour or irregular burns as being the result of ignitable liquids unless there's specifically a positive lab test to go with it. So when Mr. Wood says you can have a specific burn and a positive test, you're limiting that only to the same burn pattern? Yes, it has to be associated with the, with the, with the burn damage you see. And is that what 921 actually limits it to? Yes. Uh, doesn't it actually give the fire investigator discretion to interpret that uh, as a burn from an incendiary source? Only to the extent where there is um, isolated burns of well-defined uh, of, of well origin, limited in extent, not a complete area involved in fire damage. Isn't this the kind of detail that is not unusual for, in a courtroom, you to be on one side testifying about and somebody on the other side testifying in a different manner uh, and the judge has admitted evidence from both sides? Yes. The issue is I have the scientific proof to back me up because well, I've done the tests and published your, them. That's certainly your your version, but at least in the court system, the court system hasn't deemed the DeHaan book as the only testimony admissible in evidence, has it? Not to my knowledge, no. Okay. So there certainly is a range of professional testimony that can come into court uh, on these various subjects. Yes. We're not dealing with absolutes, are we? In most cases, no, we're not. That's, that's all I have. Okay. And let, let me understand you before you. I have the book, and I've read that particular area on there. It was my understanding that when you do, in fact, get deep burns, it is much more consistent with threshold. And in fact, deep burns rarely occur with accelerants. Do I understand that correctly? That's correct, because some of the, some of the other pictures in the book are fire tests where we've actually put ignitable liquids on surfaces, burned them, and showed the essential absence of deep burning. That's absolutely so, correct. So in fact, understanding what was written in the book, am I correct in saying that there is in fact proof of flash over if there is a deep burn? That's correct. And furthermore... That's, I'm you, sorry, that's, that's one of the criteria. One of the yes. criteria. And then furthermore, these were all controlled burns where there was clear observation and they, they, we clearly knew that there were no accelerants present. Am I correct? That's correct. And that we, in fact, there were experiments done to show that with accelerants, there were no deep burns in most cases. That's correct. Thank you. I think we heard uh, Mr. Salazar say that it was his opinion that the original investigation did, in fact, uh, follow the standard of 921, and I think maybe Mr. Wood uh, gave that opinion as well. Is that I, I, is that your opinion? Well, it followed, um, my reaction was it followed the steps, but not the logical consequences, not the, an, uh, the analysis that, that needs to be carried out. And I made the mention this morning that if I have, could have and could have, it doesn't mean that's the answer. It means just that. Those are possibilities uh, or even probabilities. But when you testify in court that this, is, this was in the, a, uh, an incendiary fire caused by ignitable liquids, it's got to be more than probabilities. And did you see anything in the PowerPoint presentation that we, we all watched that changed your opinion that you would now go from an undetermined to an arson? No. It would still be an undetermined fire. Following the precepts of 921 or my own text. The photograph yes, of the ceiling that Mr. Salazar showed us, is that consistent with flashover and the deep burn on the floor? Is that the condition of the ceiling? Yes. In fact, I'm, I'm glad you mentioned that because it indicates very high 
energy hot smoke layer and causing drop down. Uh, was, there was an a mention made that there wasn't anything to fall on the floor because the, the ceiling was still intact. Well, that one picture that we showed looked like there was something falling off the floor, off the ceiling, and could have created uh, localized burns on the floor. But yes, that's one, of the, that's one of the other indicators. High temperatures at the ceiling, fairly uniform damage to the walls, all the way down to the floor and then irregular burning. And what, and what uh, Mr. Wood was alluding to was, yes, we once thought it was radiant heat only, and then as we watched more and more fire tests and we understood the dynamics, what happens in flashover, it becomes an extremely turbulent fire, which is now driven by the ventilation more than anything else, because everything in the room is on fire that can burn is burning. And now the ventilation point uh, is one of the controlling factors of how intense the fire is. And so breaking windows, open doors, all drive the fire in very irregular uh, and often, in some cases, unpredictable means. And so you have to look at the ventilation points and realize that, gee, a lot of the damage to that bedroom was around the, the windows and doors, and in some cases, connecting them. That's all part of that extremely turbulent post-fire environment. Uh, sorry, post-flashover environment. There may be a noise associated with that, a roar or sound or... So yes, yes, we've noticed that uh, there is a, a transition and when it becomes extremely turbulent, you hear this whoa, 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 is the air trying to move in and out at the same time. So yes, that from the outside uh, witness could hear a, a transition. And in some cases, that's their only warning that there's something burning in the house, is that transition. Or as windows fail, you hear the crash of glass, look over, and there's flames gouting out of the now open window, or broken window, I should say. I'd ask Robert to own a question if it's possible. I'd like to get your opinion of the, I'm not sure what the proper term for the paper that was shown on the ceiling. And I don't think there was any sheetrock or anything on the outer surface. I think that paper was the outermost surface. But to me, if that hot layer is up there, I mean, the, where's the hottest temperature going to be? It's going to be up against the ceiling. Why did that paper survive up there? Well, it, it, it looked like it survived. Once again, I, like you, I shared a limitation. I didn't see the scene, so all we have is pictures. Yes, but, but if I have paper secured to a flat surface, it's going to be pretty resistant to combustion. Uh, once it starts to